Um, are we okay on sound? Frozen? Okay, good. Um, so we're pushing towards the end here. I see someone has taken the initiative to encourage you to do the capes. It's kind of unfair to like, how can you do that before the course is already over, before it's over? So um, I realize that the, the, um, a 90% threshold is difficult to achieve in any group of people. So I haven't checked on the, our initiative to overtake Dr. Lapome in terms of um, red ho or hot chili pepper ratings. Um, but I have one hot chili pepper? Yes, okay. Well, if, let's keep an eye on that because if, depending on how that comes, <laughs> we can, um, we could maybe, we can drop that threshold to 80% if there's some more traction on the, on the chili pepper initiative. Because um, 90% is really, I don't think, I mean, so if we can get 80%, no, seriously, uh, chili peppers out of it, that's a joke. Um, but if we, we'll drop that to 80%. So 80% CAPES participation rate, and then I'll drop the lowest two homeworks, okay? So today we're going to talk, we've talked a lot about surfaces and why different surfaces have different energy. And today we're gonna to talk about tools to, um, to stabilize the, the particle surfaces. So I hope you're gonna find the last few, the last, what do we have? One, two, three, four, the last four lectures to be very pragmatic and very practical, less theory-based and more application-based, which is, which is where my interests primarily lie. This is a good, uh, this section is also really good. So this, this is on the, a lot of this is from the last chapter, or the last section of Andrea Tao, but this section in the big book I think is also um, decent. So I would take a look at that as well. Okay, um, so, okay, so review session three, um, I, we have a room now, SME 346 at 8 p.m. So we did a dry run where I was like Skyping in from the office, from my office into the conference room where the TA was and it seemed to work fine. Um, one issue is gonna be like how do you draw on the board? So if you have a question, it'll be much easier for me if you just write it out on a piece of paper and you're like, you know, and take a picture of this with your question because um, if, you, if you try to come to the conference room and then write on the board and then she tries to get the camera close to that, that's going to be a, a mess. So, so if, you, if you come, pr email me this in advance of this review session, then hopefully um, that'll make everything a lot smoother. And then I can probably write out an answer and show it on the screen. Okay, yeah. So will the uh, video aspect be like live stream mm -hmm. publicly? Yeah, anybody can come to this to the to the thing at 8 p.m. So if you, I, I'm not gonna I'm gonna answer these at that time. I'm not gonna like send back a a, mil, a lot of emails. I, I think it's more efficient because if you have that question, there's probably other people that have that question. Okay. Um, and then if some of you weren't here, I did decide on this last exam you can bring a three by five note card for equations, etc. Okay, we'll do that for this last exam, um, unlike the other two. Okay, so reminder that uh, surfaces come at an energetic cost, right? Because we have more broken bonds, and so therefore there's an energetic cost to that. And that curvature can further decrease the thermodynamic stability, especially when we go to smaller and smaller and smaller situations. We have a larger pressure across that membrane as we go to smaller and smaller uh, dimensions. So, Nanoparticles have this large surface area to volume ratio and a high degree of curvature. So they're, by definition, much more unstable than bulk systems. So how, how, do we, how do we keep them from going together, right? I said that half of my career has been looking at crap at the bottom of a tube, right? And that the goal is to always have them be nice, stable nanoparticles, but that they like to, aggregate together because when they aggregate together, we're having two cubes and they go and become one rectangle, they've just negated that surface area, right? So they've gotten rid of that surface area and they have, they've changed the surface area to volume ratio and therefore they've become 
um, more stable. Unfortunately, as they become bigger and bigger and bigger, they start to lose the properties that made them interesting to begin with, right? So how to then to, to minimize this? Well, um, there's, we'll just talk briefly about liquids. How would you do that with a liquid nanoparticle? What's a common liquid nanoparticle that we work with? Yeah, or a mm, my cells, right? My cells are kind of a common approach. And so there, the, the most common approach is to use some kind of surfactant, right? And I just learned this when I was putting this together. Surfactant is a surface active agent. That's where the word comes from. A surface active agent is a surfactant. And so people, what, an, another word that people use, especially biologists, they'll use the word detergent. And detergent's kind of a loaded word just in terms of what it means in um, the lay community, right? It's like soap. But if, if you hear a biologist talking about a surfactant, they'll also use the word detergent. So again, we know that it has a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic constituent. And we talked about this one for making, what kind of nanoparticle were we making with C CTAB? Gold nanorods, nano right? So we talked about this as, so the cetal replies to the number, the carbon chain here, trimethyl ammonium bromide, right? C tab, okay? And remember this, um, where we talked about how it, this surfactant preferentially associated with the um, with the one one zero planes, but not the tips. I'm, I'm sorry, the one zero zero planes on the side, but not the one 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 on the tips. Okay, and that therefore, because of that increased association of the surfactant, there was growth on the tips, but not on the sides. Right, and this one did not make it on the homework, didn't? I threatened to put that on there, and then I went back through, and I was like, I realized I never put that on there. So, oh well, for next year. Um, okay, this one's another very popular one, especially for, for liquids. That was kind of an aside on the, on the CTAB, but SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate. Um, so a 12 carbon chain in this situation, and then a positively, ch or excuse me, a negatively charged sulfate group on the end. Um, and these make um, my cells very quickly and very stably. Um, do you know what the CMC is? the critical micelle concentration. Um, so that's a situ, the concentration where you go from right, it makes sense that at a low concentration there's just not enough energy to have them form this kind of complicated architecture, relatively complicated. Have you seen self-assembled monolayers, SAMs? Does that come up in another class? Polymers. What's that? Polymers. Yeah, uh, polymers. polymers, that's a dedicated topic in polymers, right? Self-assembled monolayers are kind of the exact same thing as this, right, only on a on a linear surface. So when we have a liquid surface, this is frequently what um, these kinds of materials will look like, right? So if this was water, this, would, this, had to, this has to be a polar liquid here, right? Because the charged head group is pointed in towards the solvent and the nonpolar tail is pointed out, right? But of course the situation is inverted if we have oil, right? So if we're encapsulating it or making some kind of oil nanoparticle in a, in, a, in a water or aqueous environment, then the tails point in towards the nanoparticle and the head points out, okay? The um, situation is inverted there, okay? So if you, don't, if you haven't seen self-assembled monolayers, 
SAMs. <coughs> it's just basically, if you have a constant layer like that. On a, on a, and it's very common on gold in particular. Okay, so that's liquids. But most of what people do in terms of solidifying things are with solids. So we're going to talk about five different ways that people um, stabilize nanoparticles. And the first one, and it, the first one is kind of more theory. You, you guys did have um, 101 with Lipomi. So he talked about DLVO theory then, right? Yeah. Um, so we'll just review that briefly. Well, maybe if you've had it, so what are the, t what forces are we balancing? Van der Waals and EDL, right? So, so this is our distance D between NPs. And so if this is then the overall attraction, well, where this is repulsion, and this is attraction. Potential energy, yes. And so then our van der Waals forces are going to be attractive at low, at low distances, right? When we have particles very close together, they're going to be attracted to each other. <clears throat> but as they become farther and farther apart, there's not going to be any interaction, right? Similarly, for our, electric, our electric double layer, electrical double layer, at very, very small distances, it's going to be repulsive. But as they become farther and farther apart, it's going to have no interaction. Right, what do we mean by the electrical double layer. It's this notion that if you have this charged nanoparticle, or any, I mean, a nanoparticle, there's going to be a layer of charge X. It's drawn here as if the, the particle is negative, right? So it has a, a layer of positively charged counter ions, then a layer of negatively charged ions, and then this cloud disperses out from there. Okay, so what's the main factor that governs how thick that layer is? Ion concentration, and so how does it, how, at higher ion concentrations you have, le well, less repulsion, yes, but what happens here? Thinner, or th does the electrical double layer, at, if with you increase ionic strength, what happens to the double layer? Ionic strength of the solvent. Concentration of ions, AKA concentration of ions. So if, if you add sodium chloride, what happens to the double layer? It comes thinner, actually. And think of the reason is because you have more counter ions out here that are essentially going to stabilize those ions that are around the particle. If there's only, if you have like no other ions in solution, they're gonna be attracted to that particle, okay? And therefore you're gonna have a thicker electrical double layer. Which then in turn, if you have less 
of a double layer, you're going to have less repulsion. OK? And this is from the big book, um, where it's showing two different ionic strength situations. OK, so here the green is the nanoparticle and the pink is the electrical double layer. So if we increase the ionic strength, there's just basically more ions in general everywhere. So there's less of a reason for them to cluster around the nanoparticle core, right? And therefore, there's less repulsion, more attraction, more aggregation, OK? Um, do, 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 do. That's a key point. Um, this is a factor of 1 over d squared. And this is a factor of e to the minus d. What else do you think governs the electrical double layer besides distance, ionic strength, charge of the particle. Solvent. So what's the charge called? The charge of the particle is the? Somebody wants to say it. The zeta potential, right? Don't make me draw a zeta. That's the hardest Greek symbol ever. Um, what else? The, the solvent, the, the, um, the nanoparticle radius. Forget everything, get anything. Distance D. Temperature is relevant. And it's actually, if this has to be greater than 10 times thermal energy, um, in order for that electrical double layer has to be 10, more than 10 times kT thermal energy at any given point. So if you cool down your particles, or cool down the solvent, it will be um, easier to stabilize them. Yeah. Yeah. So for the Pendleton's first, it could be 1 over d to c? It's not, d, it's not 1 over d to the sixth um, because you're considering these bigger systems, relatively bigger <coughs> systems, right? As opposed to, it, you're right that Van der Waals forces are 1 to the sixth when we were looking at, for example, areas of a molecule. But here it's one to the six. The other reason is that we've in, if you really look at the full equation of this, it's okay. This is the full um, the ex expression for the Van der Waals attraction in. Th this kind of DLVO theory. And this Hamaker constant incorporates that 10 to the sixth power, right? Because this Hamaker constant is, a f is also a function of the type of material. And so that's why this is not to the sixth power, rather to the squared. Yeah. Is this in, in terms of energies or forces? This this is in terms of energies, yes. Yes. Read the section on the book on, around this, this 6.4 because they, they, I, they give some more expressions that I didn't think were appropriate or interesting enough to discuss further. But they derive an expression for um, then all of the repulsive forces where they put all of this together. Um, into an expression, but I'm don't, I'm not going to take time to cover it. Okay.
So this is just something else I stole from Wiki um, that looks at how the surface separation changes, or excuse me, how the surface separation affects the double layer at these different ionic strength concentrations, right? So it becomes at any given distance at high or at low ionic strength, there's more repulsive force than at low, right? Another way to think about it is that if you have more ionic strength, it becomes um, harder for them to see each other, right? Because there's essentially more ions in between each other, right? But I think about thinking, shrinking the double layer is probably an easier way to think about it. Um, so just a couple points then. So right, if we put these together, this is the van der Waals forces here. This is another plot. Then this is the electrical double layer force. This is if you were to combine them, right? And there's three points on here that are probably important. The primary minimum is where everything crashes into your tube, right? You're, and, and it's irreparable. There's no getting those particles back, okay? they're that close together, that they've essentially become bulk material. The maximum is where the repulsion is greater than the attraction. You've got stable particles, okay? Huzzah. Again, primary maximum needs to be greater than the thermal energy, otherwise you become, you, you have less repulsive attraction and more aggregation. And then the third point is this secondary minimum where you can have some kind of flocculation, but it's reversible. Okay, so you could maybe um, vortex your tube and have a stable suspension again for another couple days. Okay. Okay. Um, another approach is polymers and adsorbates. Okay, so here is we're not we're not um, changing the solvent per se, but we're changing the surface of the particle by putting other stuff. So here you're physically at least with a lot of polymers, you're physically increasing the distance, the steric distance between these two particles. Um, and so people, you can do covalent chemistry or nonspecific. By far, one of the most popular approaches um, to maintain colloidal stability, okay? Um, this was something I made um, a long time ago um, to talk about the most popular one, ethylene glycol. So ethylene glycol, this is polyethylene glycol, and then this is a pegylated nanoparticle. Okay, so particle core, peg coat. Um, the mechanism of polyethylene glycol is that it essentially, at least the mechanism, this is probably out of topic, this is more of a biological approach, but how does it keep these particles circulating in vivo? Right, that's generally why people want to do this. One is to stabilize them, and two, you can inject them into a mouse or a person, and they are not taken up by the liver, okay? And the reason is, is that when you inject any foreign body, the body, in, the human body, identifies it with these opsonin proteins, and then the macrophages come and take that up and liver sequesters it. But these opsonin proteins can't associate with a pegylated nanoparticle, because this is such a, um, this is so hydrated, this ethylene glycol retains such a water cloud around it that, that there's no, the ability of these opsonin proteins to tag the particle or reduce significantly, okay? Um, so when you buy polyethylene glycol or you make polyethylene glycol, it generally comes as a molecular weight. And so this I thought was neat where this was a 5,000 K molecular weight, or excuse me, 5,000 molecular weight polyethylene glycol chain that we put then in the mass spectrometer. And so sure enough, the peak is at 5,003 mass to charge ratios, right? But then you get, but each of these peaks is one monomer more or less, right? So this would be one more ethylene glycol unit. So N plus one is right there. N plus two is right there. N plus three, N plus four, N plus five, N plus six. And then going the other way, N minus one, N minus two, N minus three, N minus four, N minus five. Right, so the difference is ex it's like 44 um, grams per mole, which is exactly one uh, monomer of ethylene glycol. Okay. Um, 
So there's two, have you, how much of this stuff have you seen? Have you seen peg and brush conformations? No? Okay. So there's two different conformations that um, peg can take on a particle. And one is called mushroom and one is called this brush conformation. And so it's primarily a function of concentration. So if this is your curved nanoparticle surface, a mushroom conformation is essentially where this is curved in and in on itself. Right? But if you have them, if you start putting these more and more and more, you can imagine how there's going to be steric repulsion between them, right? And so they'll start to stand on end. And then you get this, what's known as a brush conformation. I didn't do that. <laughs> OK. So the footprint then of one ethylene glycol, by what do we mean by that? The space that it's taking on the surface. So this would be the footprint for the brush conformation, whereas this would be the footprint in a mushroom conformation, right? A bigger footprint on the nanoparticle surface. Is a function of the length of one monomer. So for PEG, it's about 3.5 angstroms. And the distance then between the PEGs. So that is really annoying. <laughs> Um, so here, this is the F. And then this is the D. Okay. And when... Come on. So then you know the, and this is the number of monomers that you have. And so when this footprint becomes larger than the distance between the pegs, you move into a brush conformation. Yeah. Is that the length of the, of the monomer or the, or the length, or I'm sorry, the number of monomers? Or is it going to be the number of uh, molecules that are associated with the individual nanoparticles? I'm pretty sure it's the number of, of monomers. The number of, so this is the length of one monomer times that number of monomers to this power is going to govern the footprint, right? It makes sense as you have more and more monomers, you're going to have a bigger and bigger footprint. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, but this is, how do you measure this? That's, that's a tough, that's a tough measurement to make. So I, so, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that people try to do it. Um, the most common is you, you start with peg initial plus nanoparticle equals NP plus peg. Then you take peg initial minus, let's write this as NP slash peg, minus NP peg <coughs> equals peg final. It's just, so let's say you wanted to use milligrams per mil. Let's say I took one milligram per mil of peg and then added um, one nanomolar of particles. This is completely unrelated to this. Yeah. Yeah. Is it similar to like how we were trying to find the surface area of Yes. So then, yes. So then you would have, okay, so I lost this much peg during my bioconjugation. Okay. And then I, if I know this, I know roughly, let's say I put in one mole and I know that each particle is 10 nanometers. So then I can calculate the surface area. So then I can start to calculate how many total surface area I had and estimate, okay, then you can actually go back and calculate the distance between each peg on the surface. 
right? And then you can say, okay, is it more or less than this theoretical footprint? So therefore I probably, how else would you do this? How else could you maybe get some data on whether you have a peg or a brush conformation? TEM. Why is TEM not gonna work? Is there any difference between the uh, Hold on, well, let's answer your question. It's too light? It's, well, light, what's a better word than light? Yes, it has a low Z number. It's not elect there's not enough electron density. So if people ever try to tell you that you, they're seeing PEG in a TEM, it's their microscope's not focused. And you see that a lot in the literature where people are saying, oh yeah, and here's my, here's my PEG, their microscope's not focused. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, right? I mean, there's no reason that ethylene glycol should be electron dense, right? It's, and it's shocking how often you see that. So, what was your idea? Um, do, is there like any difference in uh, uh, opsonin protein absorption between mushroom and brush? Yes, what do you think is going to be better at uh, preventing those? Well, yeah. Rush, right? You just simply have more, more distant. Could you just add opsonin and see? That's a good idea that I don't think I've ever seen before and see if that sticks. Yeah. If you had like, yeah. Same thing as that. Yeah. Yep. Another one that people use is fluorescence. And um, especially if you have, there's a couple ways. One, if you have a fluorophore here, at some distance, it's no longer going to be quenched. But fluorophores are often quenched when they get close to the gold surface. So that's kind of an, a, a tool to see how, how much distance you have. So if you, like, the on no, you have the fluorophore on the distal end. All right, so you would put the fluorophore like an R2. Wow, that could have been really bad. <laughs> um, measure how much has been taken, how much has been taken off. Because how do you even measure this? Peg initial m minus peg final, right? That's, you have to have some kind of label on the peg to measure it. And so absorbance is generally one of those ways. Yeah. That is going to be our topic of our lecture on Friday is going to be a whole lecture on bioconjugation. Yep. STM, um, that's also really tough because there's a technique called EELS, um, electron energy loss spectroscopy that starts to become a little more sensitive to those low elements. Um, yeah, one thing that people do do is, um, do do, is if you make a really good dispersion of particles. Is you can look at this distance in TEM. Make sense? Where if you have these really, a very clear monolayer and if you get really good at putting nanoparticles on a grid, you'll make a particle layer and um, if I remember, I'll include this paper where we talk about um, how people have used that distance to prove that their particles are stabilized. Yeah. <sighs> so that's like where you're looking at the height? Yeah, Ah, AFM. Yeah, or, yeah, and so that would start to show you this, this the, the distance. Yeah, that probably does work, yeah. One other way, is you've, you've seen Raman spectroscopy. So if you had a Raman tag here, again, if that Raman tag curled back onto the surface, you would get surface enhancement. And so you would see the Raman enhancement. It's analogous to fluorescence, right? Okay. 
This is my most cited paper. I wrote a PEG review. It's almost got a thousand citations. This is, it's from this paper. Um, another approach that people use is um, branched. If, what if you had this, these kind of branched des designs, right? So rather than having a PEG like this, you had a PEG that was like this. So what you're essentially doing there is just increasing the ability to retard these opsonin proteins even further, right? Yeah. So is like nanoparticle coagulation still like a problem? This is not a perfect situation, right? And so why? So the branch peg sort of be forcing the mushroom orientation? Yes. No, no, no. Um, are you minimizing this? You're minimizing the number of points on the surface, but you're increasing the surface area out here. So you can use a much more orientation concentration, so to speak, which is definitely more impressive. That's right. Yeah, so maybe, maybe this initial part is not perfectly linear, but by the time you get out here, they definitely are. Yeah. Yeah. Do their stuff? Um, may, may or may not, right? So if we think about plasmonics, no, that how, how that's going to affect its ability to interact with light? No, there should be no effect there. Is it going to affect its ability to be loaded with a drug and release a drug? Maybe, especially if it's kind of a polymer. Um, like you, you see a lot of um, PLGA PEG hybrid particles. Um, polylactic coglutamic acid particles, and so that, those kind of hybrid materials, their drug loading efficiency is strongly governed by how much PEG you have, right? Because the PLGA is more, it's a very common, purely, purely um, polymeric particle. This is more hydrophobic, or excuse me, hydrophilic, this is more hydrophobic. So as you change the ratio of those two, you change the amount of hydrophobic drug that you can put inside of it. So that's an example of where it would. But for plasmonics, not really. So, but going back to that question of when does this fail and why does it fail? Because it definitely fails, right? These are not perfect. So what do you think is the, what would happen? I mean, there's definitely, there's a K on and a K off of this stuff, right? Especially with gold, this is, these are generally not a very, it's a, it's a labile bond, meaning it's not a very strong bond. So there's definitely an on and an off rate here. Yeah. Could be attaching to both sides? Could be attaching to both sides. You could be kind of cross-linking this. You could have incomplete surface coverage to begin with. That's probably one of the most common effects. So maybe when you were making these, you had some that had some kind of surface defect and so when, when you were pegylating them, you missed this area here, right? And then for whatever reason, once they were in the body, they became detached and this surface area then was, was identified. Yeah. Get rid of the particles after it's in the liver? Or no, no, like before. Like once you pegylate, how does your body get rid of it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, eventually they all end up in the liver. It's just how long do you prevent that from happening? Or the kidneys. And you know the size cutoff? When do you get kidney clearance versus liver clearance? It's a little bit less, about five or six. Yeah. Yeah. So this was an, a study um, where, let's see, let's look at what they're doing. They injected these carbon nanotubes, put different kinds of PEG on them, then injected into the mouse and measured how much was in the blood at different time points, okay? So black is linear 2,000 molecular weight PEG, red linear 5,000 K, 7,000K, 12,000K, and then their pink is their new one, is their branched 7,000K. So what you really want to be comparing here is the pink to the green, 
right? Well, there's two things you can compare. One is how you get this longer and longer, more and more in the blood with longer lengths of peg, right? And then the second one is the difference between the linear and the branched. So they're showing that you get more in the blood for a longer period of time with the branch, yeah. Um, I wouldn't, I would more think about it as the body's ability to identify it and clear it from your, from the system rather than coagulation. Surely if you have a coagulated chunk of carbon nanotubes, those are definitely going to be more easily recognized by a macrophage than a monodispersed particle, but yeah. So it makes sense, longer and longer pegs, there's just gonna be simply more and more shielding. The branched, hopefully we explained. Now, what about this? What if you were using this for drug delivery versus imaging? And here's tumor. And so, if we wanted to do this for, we inject this stuff, Which one of these situations would be best if we were using these to deliver drug? Which color? Pink, right? Because we've got more time for this particle to sit here, keep circulating through the body, keep passing, keep passing, keep passing, keep delivering drug to tumor. What if we were doing imaging? What if we wanted to use this to specifically label the tumor? Black or somewhere in between, right? Why? Okay. Yeah. But if, I, if it's circulating longer, there's going to be more tumor uptake and I'll have more signal. Well, only if the tumor cells are able to uptake it. Whereas assume it is. Yeah. Every, assume every time that the, that the, <coughs> the particle circulates, like, 0.5% is uptaken, and that every time more and more and more. So you're, but what else do you have in an imaging experiment that you wouldn't have in a drug delivery experiment? I'm taking a picture. Yeah. You wouldn't want it all throughout the body once you take the picture. There you go. You want to be able to have a short amount of time before you take the picture. Right? I want to, if, if my whole body is lit up and my tumor is lit up, then I don't have any contrast. Right? So I want, the, I want, the t I want it to accumulate in the tumor and then drop back down so I have high contrast between tumor and background. Right? That's where I was going with that. To, that's, that's, not, that's a decent point, yeah, right? So I don't want to deliver drug to the entire body. Um, I just want to deliver. But in drug delivery, the argument is almost always that you want a longer circulation time because that's the only way that you have more delivery to the tumor. Unless you have something where it's triggered in the tumor and then the drug is only released there, right? So you're saying if this thing keeps circulating, it's, sy it's systemically... Yeah, I mean most of the, most particles for drug delivery are there to increase how much gets into the tumor by increasing the circulation time of the stuff. Yeah, but, uh, you, but that's a good point, is that you're also then increasing the systemic toxicity. So if you could, if you could have it only released in the tumor, then you would want a short circulation time. Yeah. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. We, it's in stuff like um, Pepto-Bismol. Um, it's in, yeah, it's in a lot of stuff. Um, I, it's, toxicity is a function of what and what. Dose and, yeah, so potency, dosage, and exposure time, right? So all of those things. So anything, I mean, this is a line that you should get used to in, in nano is that everything's toxic at some dose, right? Because that's the question that you always get is how toxic is this stuff, right? And so you, you can always say, well, I could kill you with water, right? If I gave you enough water, you would die. And... Um, 
It depends who you're talking to how well that argument works. It doesn't work very well with the FDA. Um, <laughs> so this is probably a good stopping point. We're going to talk some more about this and bioconjugation on Friday. Okay?